Think of how a wet cat smells. Would you associate that with wine? Probably not. Well, good wine. Good wine, probably not. No. Howdy, YouTube. We're back again. I know. You've missed us. Yeah, welcome back. Welcome Love back. Ya. Studio B21, back again. You know what? Comment down below the best part of your day. Yeah. What you did, know, I want to know. Did something nice happen to you today? It was an awesome day for us, so it's like, buddy. Yeah, we finally got to see each other again recording. So <laughs> yeah. It's always good to see that. You know, so what are we doing today? So we're going to start something new today. We're going to try something new. Um, the little backstory with this video is I am a married man somehow. I <laughs> don't know how she puts up with me, but you know. Wait, you're cheating to, on me? Uh, yeah, I am with oh. uh, my wife, unfortunately. But yeah, so coming from the kitchen industry, it's very sometimes, and this happens in some marriages as well, sometimes your interests don't necessarily line up. Sometimes you like different things, but you have to remember the variety is the spice of life. But every so often, your two interests between the wife and yourself will intersect in a video. And Yay! it allows you to sit down on the couch, have a drink with your wife, you know, watch a video together, enjoy each other's company without, you know, both of you going on your phones and, de and being distracted from each other. So that this, is love. Recent, this recently happened to me and my wife, actually, where she is a massive fan of the Try Guys a YouTube channel. Very, very popular YouTube channel. Some yeah, of the, they're awesome. I love them. They're great guys. Um, for those who don't know, back in way back in the day, they were part of the original BuzzFeed, Ooh. which uh, basically took the internet by storm via their you know, link to what kind of tabletop are you kind of deal quizzes back in the early 2000s. Oh, yeah, I remember those. You couldn't go, <laughs> you couldn't go to a web page without seeing one of their articles. Didn't they do like listicles in too and all that? Mm, probably. I wasn't yeah. big on it. However, you know, they took their chances. They started their own company and one of their members, Keith, has a series called Keith Eats Everything. That's the guy with the glasses, right? Yeah, the guy mm -hmm. with the glasses. Not the guy who cheated on his wife. That's a whole nother story. Guys with glasses don't cheat on their wives. Exactly. <laughs> I need somebody to help me not have a big heart. I didn't do this stuff. This is not me. I, I'm fighting for my life. <laughs> but yeah, so what we're going to do is we're going to... Uh, watch a video and we're going to break it up into parts so you'll probably be seeing this every week every other week maybe depending on what our fearless leader decides to put out but we welcome you to the intersection of my marriage interest where keith habersberger eats everything at a three michelin star restaurant eats everything on the menu everything on the menu I like the season and Northern California. They would even name the restaurant after a little known pear like fruit grown in California, the Quince. Quince was awarded its first Michelin star in 2007, a second in 2014, and a third Michelin star in 2017. Jeff Tusk has also been awarded the James Beard Foundation Award for Best Chef Pacific for his cuisine at Quince. And today, I will eat everything that makes up the California contemporary cuisine at Quince. Today's going to be really incredible. We're going to be eating here. We're going to be eating at the bar. We're going to be in the kitchen. We're going to volley back and forth through all those spaces. It's been such a fun journey on this special night, hasn't it? It's been so delicious, so beautiful. We've got some really special guests today. But let's waste no time. Let's get into it and learn a little bit about the chef. So just want to kind of go over what's going to happen is like the fact that they're going to get to go, like, obviously they've rented out the restaurant. They probably came in early morning to go through the entire menu before the restaurant opens to public, but just to have the ability to have a restaurant all to yourself and it's pretty cool to talk to the staff, to go into the kitchen where the action is. It's fucking amazing. I've, I've been 
Yeah, I can in there. By yeah. choice? Or... <laughs> yeah. Hmm? My name is Michael Tusk. I'm the chef owner of Quinn's Restaurant in Jackson Square in San Francisco. We renovated the restaurant um, and reopened after being closed for nine and a half months. So it looks dramatically kind of different. And that was a pretty big change and uh, definitely a reaction to COVID. I would describe the dining experience at Quince as uh, just an expression of uh, California, particularly uh, West Marin, with influences from usually wherever I've been last. It's really about California, our farm, fresh run farm in Bolinas, which basically supplies us with the majority of our produce. It was really about what the guest is eating and drinking and how they're taken care of. Has always been what we've been trying to accomplish, I'd say. Let's eat the menu. So, California cuisine. What does one think of when you hear California cuisine? In an help burger. That's what you think. To me, maybe I'm stuck into like the 90s of uh, the French Laundry, but I'm thinking- Helen Keller. I'm thinking, wrong Keller, <laughs> sir. Wrong Keller. I'm thinking, Keller. I'm thinking avocado, cucumber, cherry tomatoes. That's what I think of when I think of California cuisine. True. Yeah. Like farm to table, yeah. fresh stuff, you know. Every evening. Should ideally start with some champagne? Ideally, every single evening of okay. your life would start with champagne, but budgets. Uh, this one right here is Bougie Scola Le Perrier. Such a sought after champagne. It's one of the sort of cult winemakers of the, of the, of the current decade for sure. What's happening? The champagne. Glass of champagne that he is drinking is basically. Comes from a $735 bottle. Yeah. That's what they start you off with. That's at retail. At retail. Yeah. I mean, that's the bottle though. So, you know. Go back to the LCO, LCBO video explaining how wine marks up works in the links over here. Now let's see if it's worth $750. Wow. If there is a little bit of a nutty, like toasty quality to it. Speaking of which, uh, we have a little panna cotta of almond milk done with sarnicolai or cetra caviar and a little side dish of an almond waffle to go along with that. Wow, there's so much caviar. <laughs> almond and caviar. Wow, you think panna cotta is a main? That's not even a main, it's an app. Like it's a palate starter. Smooth, wow. Sort of dull. It's nice, it's a little bit nutty. Those are also pieces of some toasted almond. Ah, there's the nuttiness. I knew I tasted the nuts. Mmm. He's the gay. Wow, the crunch on that is so nice. It's got such a good bite. With caviar, you expect everything to be delicate. This is like a strong, hard, big crunch. It's a really good crunch. It's good. I just like how you can tell he's desperately trying not to finish that in one bite. <laughs> It's like, that's a one bite thing. That is a one bite thing. Yeah. <laughs> but he's like trying to stretch it out for the camera. I love it. He's right to like bounce back and forth. Yeah. The sort of the texture of this is so funny. Smooth, yeah. Bouncy. Can I describe the food as bouncy? Does that make sense? Bouncy? Yeah. It's bouncy. Well, what panna cotta is, is like a milk based dessert or main yeah that's thickened with gelatin so i mean gelatin is bouncy so you could describe it as bouncy think of a milk jello yeah that's what you think you're of. starting off with milk jello and toasted nuts that's why i'm asking it's like as an appetizer it's novel yeah and this this is the best little waffle i've ever had not that i've had a lot of little waffles to be honest Little, little tiny fireworks, like fireworks in a jar. That's what you're going for with your it's first bites. Mine. Also, this is the biggest mother of pearl spoon I've ever seen. It's the mother of all mother of pearls. And it came with its own little glass thing. Unlike me, who's a Cretan who always just puts their fork on the edge of their plate. Apparently, that's really bad. We're going to prepare a little asparagus dish right now. We're going to head back to the kitchen now for the asparagus. We're going to make uh, one of... Uh... Our spring dishes. I love yeah, green asparagus. I love white asparagus. So I figured we'll do one course with the green. That would still allow me to do the uh, white asparagus later on in the menu since they have different uh, flavor profiles for the egg. Blanched, then uh, we peeled the egg, took the shell off, a little bit of flour, egg, and some breadcrumb. So it's an egg, and then 
It also has egg wash on it. And over there, you got some yeah. egg. We will let this sit for a second, and then we'll test our asparagus, see if it's cooked enough for you. Oh, yeah, it's great. Great texture. Tender, but still has some texture to it. We're going to serve the asparagus at the table in this broth with all these uh, spring floral elements. You're just going straight into that. Yep, you'll see why. Really was not what I was expecting to happen. We're going to keep them warm by putting this broth into it, just covering them. This is all ready to go. And then got my fried egg, gonna cut it in half, gonna hollow out the yolk. We use this for a different purpose. And I'm gonna fill it some of the Tsar Nikolai caviar from the Sacramento area. You do a great job of really incorporating so many California things into kind of everything here. That's what we're trying to do. Have that, we have the egg yolk, some little mustard flowers. Are those actual little mustard? Yep. Oh. There's a little bit of mustard in the, the hollandaise, so that's why you put that on there. Basically, we're emulating the egg yolk by uh -huh. putting the hollandaise in. Ooh, nice. Never have too much. <laughs> yeah. So this would arrive at the table, just like that. And we would come by with the asparagus in the tank. You can see it also has mustard in there. Yeah, and this gets done by the server, so this sort of whole thing comes up and plated in. Sometimes Chef Kaylin will go into the oh, dining nice. room too, and we try to get the chefs in the kitchen, yeah. especially when we have the, uh, the peninsula there ready to go. And normally I don't assume so people just pick it up and sort of eat the whole egg. Everybody does that way. Absolutely do it. The egg. Also, you get some more hollandaise? Okay. That's like the best sort of deviled egg. Okay, I just got a comment on the foam. That's so early 2000s. But I would love the fact that they're still doing it. No, it's so you know what I like about it? it's. I like the fact that they're doing it, but I like that it's actually needed in the dish. Yes, it's not foam for foam sake. It's not foam on a plate for foam's sake. It's foam actually being used as part of the egg, which I enjoy. Yes. Now, my whole thing with this dish is. Forgive me, it's a lot for asparagus. And what do you mean? So, actually, I don't know if you guys know, but this actually is a restaurant we've seen before in one of our Alexander videos. Yeah, the link's right here. Yeah, the link's gonna be in the video description. The asparagus is just in a nice broth. I don't really know if the broth would carry into the asparagus or anything. It would by the way they're serving it. Yeah. By the way they're serving it, it's very aromatic herbs you're using. So the fact that it's aromatic and brought to the table mm. influences your nose. Fair. And most of what you taste is through the nose. The fact that they did the, like, the egg, the best way to do that is with a frozen egg, by the way. Uh, blanch it off you fry that and thing but it it is a lot it is a lot but that's what a three michelin star has to be yeah yeah you're right the crunch on the outside is so nice from the the fry the salt from the uh, the holidays and the uh caviar so good the asparagus mm, so flavorful so good also the fact that it comes in a big old sort of terrarium it's like a little ecosystem I think when you order asparagus, you don't expect this much presentation. Asparagus, any kind of vegetable, you wouldn't think it's going to have a fanfare of an entire garden that's been simmered. It's just a really indulgent, comforting, but still like kind of bright little dish. Yeah, I like it. It's a very, uh, never get tired of seeing that. It's, it's good. Really it's really good. Fun. And honestly, like I joked about it, but the different egg experiences all have a different egg quality. Like just the jammy egg by itself, the hollandaise by itself, the, the big bite, the caviar. It's really good. Sure. Really good. Well, let's uh, have a drink at the bar. The timing on that has to be very, very precise. Yes. Because you already have the asparagus blanched off and then you're putting hot water back into it. You basically need to have it out to the table within and on the plate within- Within seconds. I'm gonna say 40, 30 to 40 seconds yeah. of it being in the broth. Mm. So it is, I feel like that essentially is a very last minute item to go with different other bites. Cause there's a lot more to think about when it, it's another thing, when it gets to the table, they're not gonna eat it right away. They still have to present it. They, they still have to present it, on a plate. and people will take pictures, and people will, will stop to admire it. Yes. And all that time, it's still cooking. Still cooking. <laughs> so, getting from a cooked product, then cooled down, then blanched off again. Yep. 
then still cooking on the plate. The timing on that has to be spot on. It's time for a little cocktail break. Now, unfortunately, the audio for the bar section of this video got corrupted somehow, so I'm going to be narrating this experience for the bartender and my... Try guys, they're just like us. <laughs> they're just like us. <laughs> What's wrong with your audio, man? So, so that's what's going on. The bartender here, he's actually making the quince martini, which is an infused cocktail with chamomile infused gin and dry vermouth. So it gives a bit of richness, a bit of sweetness. The glass they're serving us in is paper thin. The drink is actually heavier than the glass itself, which is really a unique experience. As you can see, I say, oh, wow. That's really good. <laughs> I almost exclusively actually drink dirty gin martinis, uh, so I'm not used to this, but this has a great sweetness, and in my own words, is really, wow. Has no edge at all, a dangerous martini. Next up is something not so classic. It's served over crushed ice, though so almost drinks like a snow cone. The cocktail starts out strong, but as the ice melts, it transforms to be a bit smoother, a bit more approachable. The taste is incredible. It feels like a drink of spring. I mentioned that it's something I love how he uses his fingers to adjust the ice in front of the customer. Just something you notice. Yeah, little things. You drink while you look out at the farm. There's a little note of thyme in the drink, which is a nice little herbal moment. Uh, it's a little fruity, a little tart, like a tequila drink should be. And I didn't think it was actually too strong at all, but maybe that's something I need to look inward on. But hey, maybe you don't want to. My thing with his comments about the tequila drink being too strong especially in a three Michelin star restaurant, you do not want your customer wasted off of one cocktail and not able to appreciate what you are putting in front of them. So more than likely it is probably very little tequila in that, but once again, it could be also tequila's heat tolerance to it. True, yeah. Considering there's a wine pairing for every dish. Yes, mm. which I'm surprised he didn't go for, but you know what, we'll see. Alcohol. A mocktail is more your speed. They got you covered. Uh, today we're going to be having a citrus forward, herbal, almost aperitif cocktail. It smells super herbaceous and fragrant, which I expertly explain. It smells like plants. The good plants that you want to smell. <laughs> it's a little tart, uh, limey, very pleasant mouthfeel, almost a savory drink, and it is like an aperitif. It, it makes me want to eat, which works out great because now we have some snacks that can be ordered a la carte at the bar. First up, the celeriac crisp with Asian pan. How much do you think that dish is? That, those three little bites? 50. Hair and black truffle. I don't know why I thought this dish was going to be sweet. Um, maybe because of the Asian pear. Uh, I mentioned it's actually much more savory. Almost reminds me of the chicken and a biscuit cracker. So much flavor in that crisp little bite. Next up is the onion cracklette, which I assume means tiny cracker, with Tsar Nikolai caviar and Meyer lemon. The flavor here, Ooh. it's like a dream. Like a dream that you're still dreaming. It's confusingly good. In fact, both of these snacks so far, they're such a good way to start the meal. There's so much flavor with a great little crispy texture. Reminds me of having like nuts or snacks at a bar. The way, you know, they're salty, they encourage me to take a refreshing swig of my drink. And lastly, a little chip of nettle with pistachio and ricotta. Uh, I can't stop talking about how it looks like a little sandwich made of leaves here, but I love it. Wow, uh, it, it is great and unique at the fact that you can make little leaves crispy like that. Crazy. These are just elevated bar snacks. They have great textures, great flavors. They're crispy, creamy, and let's. I like that he says it like they are, like it is from a normal person's perspective, that it is just elevated bar snacks. Yes. He realizes that. It, and it's really, it's easy and hard at the same time to do those leaves. Extremely hard. Because it's it's just frying it, but leaves by the, their nature like to curl up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, perfectly flat like that, there's a technique to it, which takes a lot of time. And then he said that stuff is a la carte actually. So it's not like, you have, you have to make 20 for 20 seats. Anyone could order as many as of those as they want. Yeah. And I'm, you I'm might not, be doing it to order, actually. Are you doing that out of me? Maybe. I don't know. Uh, it's like, good lord. But yeah. And just like, I will be the bar snacks. Yeah. That's pretty cool. I, I, I want to say that I'm very appreciative that he's giving this perspective of an actual normal person for these drinks, these food, like 
for when we watch. <laughs> let's, let's call it average person. The average person. Because <laughs> I know I'm not like, normal. Like, for example, when we, when we watch, like, the Alexander videos, that is someone who has been to multiple Three Michelin star restaurants. It doesn't really phase him anymore. It doesn't phase him anymore. He knows he's, what he's getting he's into. He's coming in from a business perspective. Everything is precise in his reviews. This, it's fun to see someone seeing this for the first time. Yeah. Yeah. I dig that. I dig that. Uh, the next set of courses. How about this? That's for a big bottle is big. Okay. So big. Almost the size of a small wiffle ball bat. Have you ever used an empty bottle for a game of wiffle ball? That would be uh, great, but uh, I might not have my job up. Uh, I would do it here. So, another part of San Fran. Well, uh, this is uh, quite a special wine. This is uh, close to Rome, coming from the Sierra foothills. Very small production coming in from a vineyard called Renaissance Vineyard. All the sort of uh, benchmarks of a great German Riesling is going to have that sort of almost petroleum uh, highest. Great German Riesling smells like gasoline. <laughs> <laughs> that's why. I but have... that's the thing about being a sommelier. Sometimes you like it's a great wine, but just the way people describe it is so weird it's... i once had when i was when i was doing <laughs> wine studies in college because i went both me and nano went to school for culinary i somehow got into a wine class as part of my course and i had a sommelier who described the scent of a wine we were tasting of a of a wet cat yeah now think of how a wet cat smells would you associate that with wine probably not well, yeah good wine Good one, probably not. No, but that's the thing. It's like there are little notes, there's little chemical reactions that yep. happen in wine during the aging process, during the stomping process, during the al making the alcohol. Yeah, and which hints at little things like this. So you're not wrong, but you're probably not right. Yeah, acidity. But at the same time, since it's sat in the bottle for about twenty years now, it's developed these. Almost. I see this is number 13 and 18. Yes, 18 bottles of this one. That's not a lot. That's very few. This is so amber. The color of this. Whoa, wow, that smells like liquor, like <laughs> strong, intense smell. Wow. Brian, I'm going to be honest with you, that smells like pure gasoline. That is really good. It has a little bit of a Funkiness, the nuttiness, but really the smell is like so overwhelming. And then you get it, it's actually kind of tart, a little bit sweet. It has that nuttiness. Mm. That's complex. That's like a relationship where you don't know where you stand. It's quite complicated. What are these? Our non alcoholic pairing, which we pour with the white asparagus dish. This is going to be a little tea made with dehydrated white asparagus peels. So, zero waste, done with a little kombu stock passion fruit oil, and a little Meyer lemon zest. This smells like soup. It's hot. I, it is soup. I didn't think it was hot. I'm not sure why I didn't think it was hot, but it, it's tea, so it makes sense. It is soup. It is soup. It's, it's a dashi. Communi community note from X underneath. It is soup. It, it, it's exactly a soup. It's <laughs> not like asparagus tea. Some expensive tea there. Are you sure that's not soup? It can be if you want almost, I, lo I love it because it almost tastes like food. I love it. And I get it because it's from the asparagus. It has these oils in it. Wow, that's so good. I, you could serve this to me as soup and I would be, I'd be, I'd be drinking. Kombu seaweed, used in dashi. Oh, that's delicious. Wow, that's real. You saw it has like. Kombu is seaweed made, in da made into dashi. They substituted with needle flakes for dried. Asparagus peels. Yep. So it's a as white asparagus dashi, which is a, just a Japanese soup. Which explains the, like, the intense flavor of it. That stock, so it really it tastes like soup. Like really good soup and tea at the same time. Tea wow. is soup, Beautiful. technically. So <laughs> asparagus tortelloni with a fermented white asparagus sauce, radish blossoms, and tarragon. So many different, like, off-white whites playing against each other. The white asparagus tortoise. Mm -hmm. That's really good. Wow. 
that's how it happens every time somebody eats this. <laughs> Do you just slowly have guests sort of collapse in their tables? That was so overwhelmingly delicious, rich and velvety, creamy. Wow, really remarkably good. I don't really think I understood the difference between the asparagus asparagi. There are many foods that are creamy that aren't worth the complications that come from eating dairy. This is worth it. This is a thousand times worth it. This is like if we were at home and I, no one was watching me, I would lick this plate clean. I would stand in the kitchen and turn it on its side. Like, I won't do that here. Take that out of context. <laughs> Okay, first of all, I love the white on white on white plating. Yep. I love the simple plating and the play on white. Love it. And <laughs> fermented cream sauce. Did, what's that mean? Did they just leave the cream sauce in the sun? Room time cream sauce. Yeah, you know, it's like, it smells a bit off. No, 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 no. It's fermented. It's room temp. Don't worry. We're no, good, guys. We're good. We're good. Send it. Send it. Do you guys remember Falcor from Neverending Story? You know the majesty of that dog dragon? That is the effect this dish is having. Does everybody compare it to uh, the Neverending Story? Have you seen that movie? It's a good one, huh? Except for <laughs> the horse guys. That. That's sad. What? It's, it's, it's part of the story. Well, okay, it's about almost a 40 year old film at this point. Let's find out what's next. It's on fire. Been a journey so far, and guys, and we're only 15 minutes into the video. Yeah, so, we have another hour. Got yeah. another, got another little bit to go. Yeah. But let us know in the comments what you what you think of it so far. What do you think of the wines, the food, the ambiance? What do you think of Keith doing this in general? I quite like it. I I, I like his stand where he comes from. Yeah. And the way he, he looks at the food. You I know, like, you know, he's, he's sort of overwhelmed by this. I get that feeling. I like the yeah. cut of his jib. <laughs> <laughs> but know? yeah, so guys, we look forward to seeing you in part two, where we're going to be doing a risotto in this video, and we'll see what else happens. All right. So, so yeah, be good to you, be good to others. And we'll see you soon. Enjoy, guys. Bye.